This video is predominantly on the view of metaphysical holism, contrasting against its rival view, metaphysical atomism. Holism, moreover, is also closely interrelated to the metaphysically and theologically significant view of Spinoza's, which I have covered in a few previous videos. It, it, it may not be necessary to have watched these other videos in order to appreciate what I'm sharing in this present video, but I would encourage you to watch them first if it is possible, as it would greatly put into perspective what I'm about to share. Thus I'll begin with the concept of the all, or all that is. I wish to relate to you in more detail why it is that this concept of all that is represents a single, indivisible, individual whole, rather than a mere collection of parts. For example, one may form the concept of the set of all objects on my desk, but this set, consisting of papers, pens, mail, phones, or books, is not a single individual, it is merely an aggregate of parts. By contrast, the set of all molecules in my desk, or the set of all cells in my body, is not an aggregate of parts, but a single individual whole, the desk and my body, respectively. Why do we insist that God, defined as all there is, is more like the set of all cells in my body than the set of all objects on my desk? That all there is is a whole, and not a mere aggregate of parts. Now, although Spinoza believed rightly, I think, that the holistic nature of all there is could be demonstrated a priori, that is, from the very concept of, or definition of all there is, he also believed that our minds are more likely to be convinced uh, by a posteriori demonstrations, that is, by appeals to our own experience. We are fortunate today to have at our disposal a wealth of collective experience, namely science, that was unavailable in Spinoza's time. We, we will use the results of quantum theory and modern cosmology with just enough explication of the physics to render the concepts intelligible, to show that the physical universe, and we here consider only the physical world, the mental world we will discuss later, is a single individual, individual and indivisible whole. Let us use the term holism to refer to any metaphysical framework which holds that the world is a single, indivisible whole, not reducible to the sum of its parts. And let us use the term atomism to refer to any metaphysical framework which holds to the world, or holds that the world is not an individual, indivisible whole, but rather is made up of and reducible to its parts, that the world is an aggregate of parts. Each framework carries with it an associated methodology, that is to say, a way of approaching any given problem. For example, if, as atomism asserts, the world really is made up of parts, then the right method of understanding any phenomenon is to break it up into its constituent parts. These parts will in turn also have parts, and this process of reduction continues until one has reached the ultimate parts. On the other hand, if the whole is more than the sum of its parts, as holism asserts, then the correct method of understanding any particular thing involves finding a larger whole in which the particular thing is embedded. This larger whole will itself be embedded in still a larger whole, and this process of embedding continues until one has reached the ultimate whole, all there is, or God, according to Spinoza. The human body, for example, conceived atomically, is made up of cells, so to understand the body, one must understand the behavior of cells. But cells are, in turn, made up of molecules. So to understand the cells, one must understand the behavior of molecules that constitute the cells. But molecules are made up of atoms, and so on. And this process of division continues until one has reached the ultimate building blocks of the material world. On the other hand, the human body, conceived holistically, is in dynamic interaction with a larger physical ecosystem, without which the body would neither have been brought into being nor continue to be. Thus, to understand the body, one must understand the larger ecosystem in which the body is embedded, and which makes the uh, continued existence of the body possible. This larger system, from which the body receives its food, oxygen, water, and so forth, is embedded in a still larger system, Earth as a whole, which is embedded in a still larger system, the solar system, the galaxies, and so forth. And this process of embedding continues until one has arrived at the ultimate ecological unit, the universe as a whole. 
Now, both holism and atavism, considered as methodologies, are immensely useful, and both can be employed simultaneously to understand any given phenomenon. A, meteor a meteorologist, for example, to understand the weather, would need to know about both the nature of the molecules that make up the atmosphere and how the atmosphere interacts with the surface of the Earth. However, holism and atomism, when considered metaphysically as, uh, as theses about the nature of reality, cannot both be true. For either the physical world is made up of ultimate parts, in which case atomism is true, or it is not made up of ultimate parts, in which case holism is true. So let us suppose for the moment that atomism is true, that the physical world is constituted by or made up of ultimate building blocks, and that everything is explainable in terms of the nature and arrangement of these ultimate parts. What must these parts be like? First of all, these parts must be simple. For if they were complex, that is, if they were made up of anything, then they would not be ultimate, but would depend upon the things out of which they were made. More importantly, the ultimate parts must be independent. Now, by hypothesis, the ultimate parts cannot depend upon anything other than themselves, because there is nothing other than these ultimate parts. Anything that is not itself an ultimate part is merely an aggregate of a certain number of these parts. Moreover, a given ultimate part cannot depend on other ultimate parts. For if it did, if A depended on, say, B and C, which in turn depended on D, E, and F, and so forth, then one would no longer have an atomistic framework. Since each part would depend on the other parts, which would depend upon still other parts, and so forth. And this results in each part depending on the totality of all parts, which is holism. And finally, an ultimate part cannot be created or destroyed in time, for if this were to happen, then according to the principle of sufficient reason, there must be a cause for why the given ultimate part came to exist or ceased to exist, and the given part would then depend for its being on this cause and would not be independent. Keep in mind that according to atomism, anything that is not ultimate comes to be in time as a result of the motion and arrangement of the ultimate parts that constitute the thing. But this could not account for how an ultimate part itself could come into being. Therefore, in an atomistic framework, the ultimate parts must be simple, independent, uncreated, and indestructible.